hug. Are we doing hug? We're doing hug. Oh. I've missed you so much. And I'm so excited to have a sleepover. Come in, come in. Okay, just before we chat, don't tell me in a big... I've just got to put the pizza in the oven first because, you know, I can't speak on an empty belly. Let's go. Okay, 10 minutes. You've got to tell me everything. What has been happening? I need it all. Um, I know that you wanted to do a 20s toolkit series um, episode with me about friendship. So I've got loads of notes. I'm really excited to chat to you about it. Uh, if you haven't been here before, hi, my name's Lena. I do a series on my channel called the 20s called the 20s toolkit, uh, where I talk about things that I have learned in my 20s, things I wish I'd known in my 20s, and we chat about it. So I've done stuff about marriage, renting, loads of different things, and today we're gonna chat about friendship, which I think called for a sleepover. So I've got a film on, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice. It's, it's a crowd pleaser, everyone can agree on this Pride and Prejudice, so that's fine. I've got some marshmallows, if you want one of those. You want one? They're really good. Mm -hmm. Take two, take two, have it all. We're gonna have the pizza, and have a chat, maybe do a little like face mask. My skin has been in for the past two years, so God knows what's in it. <laughs> um, but it's gonna be fun, might even paint our nails, who knows. Okay, pizza, ready. <laughs> um, now, there's two things you need to know about my pizza methods, and I'm very evangelical about this. First, pizza cutters can get in the bin. This isn't part of the friendship information, this is just information you need for your life. Pizza cutters, no, we are all about the scissors. Seriously. Watch this. Oh my god, so much easier. Look at this. Incredible. And then also, M&M's on pizza. If you know, you know. Oh, Michael, you smell like soap. <laughs> Oh, I thank you, princess. <laughs> the princess of Geneva. Um, trust me, it's the best. Okay, right. First, we're going to talk about the first lie that I feel has been taught to me about friendship and I found was completely wrong. The enemies of my friends are my friends. No way. <laughs> I got it wrong. Let me say again. The enemies of my enemies are my friends. That mask doesn't add up, man. No. Brené Brown calls this counterfeit connection. Mutually hating something doesn't mean that you automatically have a connection and like each other. Common enemy intimacy, not a thing. In fact, be wary of anybody who has too many, like, explicit enemies. I totally get there's people in your past that have hurt you, but people who have no... Um, sense of like how that might fit in structurally what those people might have been through while they have boundaries and they won't let them back in they they can guess at why they acted that way and also people who are too bitchy sorry i didn't offer you one how rude <laughs> people who are too bitchy they they can make you feel really insecure and, and even if you bitch at a friend about somebody else and you know that you never bitch about that friend like you're talking about this other person there's always that hanging threat that's like so watch out, because um, you know, you're my favourite right now, but I could talk about you like this at any point. And I feel like that I've had friends like that, that I, even though they maybe wouldn't, I still worry that they might bitch about me, like they're bitching about other people to me. And I'm not saying don't ever talk about a bad event that happened, but without any kind of retrospective kind of look at how that behaviour is, or like, like really like psychologically analysing it, rather than just being like, what an evil person, I fucking hate them. Just because you both hate something doesn't mean that you're automatically going to have a connection. And I even feel like that about politics. Sometimes, like, just because, we're, because somebody's left-wing doesn't mean we're going to be friends. I actually really disagree with quite a lot of left-wing people as well, you know? There's not always going to be that intimacy and trust and connection just because you hate the same things. Even if it's a TV show. Okay, next one. I have low self-esteem, therefore it is impossible for me to be a selfish friend. I found this about myself sometimes and also about other people where because they're so insecure, they're not really looking at their behavior and thinking it could be in any way self-centered. And I actually think this is kind of survival instinct on steroids. When people are really insecure, they're just looking for the, the first person that can do things for them and fulfill their needs because they don't want to or can't fulfill their own. So I completely get it, but it's worth watching out even when you feel like you don't like yourself, that you're 
still centering yourself in the narrative. And this doesn't count for all situations. Obviously people have periods in their life where they really need help and they need the attention to be on them to heal and that's fine. But as a friend, you have to watch out for those situations where people might be acting in a really irresponsible way, putting you in danger in some way and then them demanding that you put their needs before your own, especially if it's a serious mental or physical situation. You need to just look look at, look at that person and just work out whether, even though they're going through a hard thing, they are still only centering their own experience and how you've made them feel. If, if you speak up or say, hey, this isn't working for me, this hurts, this isn't quite what we agreed to. And I think that can also happen with oversharing. So there's lots of like talk about people oversharing as a shortcut to, to intimacy. They'll tell you literally everything about their lives, something that can be tra quite traumatic. When they haven't built up that trust with you, you know that you haven't earned that information and then using that to then demand like best friend kind of privileges from you, like parts of your life and giving up parts of you yourself to support them that wasn't, hasn't been built up over time, hasn't been, isn't true connection or intimacy. Okay, next one. Being hyper interested in, in your success is the same as being proud of you. And no, <laughs> if you find somebody as a friend, but they're constantly um, kind of parading your success and their connection to you as their success, you'll know it when you see it. That can be slightly weird and it can also um, be linked to people like claiming anything that you've done as, as their success and saying like the way that you've got, the, any, any good news that you've got had them as part of it in a way that you feel is inauthentic. Inserting themselves into your success story and then asking for like some of the perks or benefits or slightly resenting you, like downplaying how hard you worked or what you got in a kind of like slightly resentful way. It can happen, you have to watch out for it and kind of call it out when it happens because I think it's so good to be proud of people but then not genuinely being proud of people and actually using it as a way to voice your resentment or um, kind of not work on yourself and also succeed in your own ways and just parading other people's. That can be like a, a weird thing that has happened kind of sometimes a lot. And I, I think it's an interesting thing that's just a human instinct, but it is something that needs to stop. Another lie, the devil needs more advocates. <laughs> he fucking doesn't. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's really good to disagree in friendships, honestly. As long as both people are listening to the other person's point of view and it's not a complete and constant hacking down of your beliefs every time you meet them, your friends should be able to listen to you in a really meaningful way and love you unconditionally, even if you never change your mind about your beliefs. And you should listen to theirs as well. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, but you know, the devil doesn't need any more help. He's fine. Okay, the next one is, once you've started learning, using the label, friends. No more needs to be said. That's it, you're done. No more work to put in. Mm -mm -mm -mm. We're gonna paint our nails, by the way. I'm thinking rainbow manicure in the style of promising young woman, but a bit more vibrant. Not really a pastels kind of person, soz. That's something you need to know about me if we're gonna be friends. Anyway, the cultural touchstones for friendships just aren't as good as they are for romantic stuff. And I've talked about that before. I think we need to fix it. But in the short term, I think it's really good to make sure that you're making people feel wanted and like establishing if you do want to have like a close friendship with somebody. Um, just making them feel like you appreciate them, even if it's just a text after you've seen them to be like, it was so nice to see you. Let's do something again soon. Here's something that I like about you. Here's something unique about our friendship that I don't find with other people, something like that. I also started like explicitly trying to learn my friends love languages. If you don't know about love languages, I'll leave links below. But like asking them about it and what theirs are and then being a bit more attentive to those people. So one of my friends love languages is words of affirmation. So I'm always like, you did such a good job on that. Can I just say, this plant arrangement is incredible. Stuff like that. Or like people who tell me like, oh, actually my love language is gifts. It's not that you need to spend more money on gifts. It's just that I'll spend a bit more, a bit more time or like have a little bit more thought process, a bit more of a story behind how I found their gift and you know, maybe even making myself that kind of thing. <laughs> you should totally live with your best friends. <sighs> If anybody got to 30 without realizing that was a bad idea, like let me know in the comments, I'm pretty sure. 
We've all realised that's not always a good idea. I think people can be really different behind closed doors. And it's really interesting, it fascinates me, um, that people are really different in home environments and that's totally okay, that's kind of normal. And especially if you consider the way people grew up being different. So something that really like surprised me when I first started living with other people and I've lived with like 34 other people in my 20s. I counted, that's how many housemates I've had. It's all been very different. Um, but I think some people grew up in households where like, it was really normal to have like quite a fiery outburst of anger or like a big contentious issue with somebody that you live with. And then the next day, like get up and act like nothing was different because I'm guessing that's how it happened at home for them. But that was not my family experience. Um, and it's, it's like a weird thing for me to get used to with somebody I'm living with. So I think it's really important before you consider living with somebody, chatting about how their home life was growing up, what they notice, what they'd like to do differently, what they think is like kind of okay. Um, again, with like feeling really close to people, some people can feel like, oh, because I live with you, it, it can be subconscious, like they don't realize they're doing it. Because I live with you, you're my family, therefore you can clean up after me, that's fine. Like, you know what I mean? There's like a jump that goes in people's heads. Um, so still like making sure that people take responsibility for themselves as adults while living with you, that's something good to observe with the current housemates they have or their current living situation before you volunteer to live with them. And ultimately, if somebody doesn't want to live with you, who's your friend, you it's really hard, but it can be, it's just, it's just a big ask. It's not like just being like, we should go to the cinema together, yes or no. Like you're basically asking for one of their kidneys. And it's such a nice thing if somebody does want to live with you, but if they don't, they shouldn't have to give reasons. Um, people have said no to living with me before. It's totally fine. Um, it is more like giving a kidney and it's, it's a big ask. So yeah, that's something I always thought about like with friendships. I was like, I can't wait to grow up and live with my friends. And sometimes it's worked so well. But it's not always it's not always the case, and I think it's good to have like a really open dialogue about that. Another lie: your two or three or one closest friend is supposed to be able to fill all your needs. No, 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 no. This one's interesting because I I understand, and I think there is a certain intimacy with with people that are your best friends that you can't replicate anywhere else. But watch out for people who want to know explicitly where they are in the ranking and like you're not allowed to have like any other best friends um because you're just a human it's the same with relationships like one person can't fulfill everything you need from human connection like come on we're not zeus here um i'm pretty for sure zeus would not fulfill any of my human needs but not the point um i think that it's important to recognize that you are human and you won't be able to give everything anybody else wants and there's also like loads of friends that I have for specific hobbies like people that I go to the theatre with or I'll talk about this like really nerdy thing with like th there are just different interests that you have that you can have this amazing connection with somebody who isn't necessarily your best friend and that's really good for your soul and your other friends should want that for you the same comes with long distance friendships I have a few really long distance friendships and um, I think it's interesting like how people respond to that. I've got some really healthy long distance friendships that have been lovely where like we're both just so excited that somebody else has somebody near them. And we, we recognize that like having a friend in your postcode is really valuable and different to being able to call them up on the phone. So I'm glad that I have friendships where like that dynamic is respected and encouraged. And we're like excited if other people have a friend because at the end of the day, if my best friend makes a friend that's a potential friend for me because I trust them the most. So I'm excited that they found somebody else, one of, one of us, one of us. Um, but I just get excited by that. And I think it's a red flag if people don't get excited that you have other friends. Oh, ranking for this is really bad as well when it comes to like wedding stuff. I hate, I hate the whole like, who's gonna be the maid of honor? Are you gonna make it into the bridal party? Like, oh my God, bin, put it in the bin. I, I hate the competition when it comes to that. Red and yellow and pink and green. Yes, yeah, orange next. <laughs> um, the next one is, it should always be tit for tat. Mm -mm. Sometimes it's tit for tit. Sometimes it's two tats for you, no tats for me, and that's fine. And um, I think people that really, it's always obviously good to keep a balanced relationship where you're both respecting each other, listening to each other, giving each other space to talk and vent. But some people are just gonna have harder lives than you or vice versa. And that's just, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. It can just happen like that. Um, and like, so the friends that I have that like have, have been having consistently hard times for a while, they still check in with me. They still want to know my news and know that I'm okay, but they, they have needed more from me sometimes. And what's my reward for that, you ask? 
well, it's just having a bloody easier life, isn't it? I'm lucky that those things aren't happening to me and I'm happy to be there for my friends who are struggling. As a like section B uh, for this is to watch out for people who I call our favor monsters. So people who will do a favor for you and then bring it up with you at inappropriate moments. So like, you can't criticize me or say anything like that. Remember that time I did something for you? <laughs> <laughs> and you realize that that wasn't actually a gift that was given or something that was given out of um, a genuine affection or, or worry for you, but something where they were actually secretly expecting something back or some kind of blind loyalty that doesn't invite any kind of input <laughs> or compromise. Um, beware of the favor monsters that always want a tit for tat. Sometimes you just don't get the tits and that's, that's just how the cards fall. <laughs> got my hot chocolate with marshmallows. I've got my fluffy comfy sucks. <laughs> Are the Bo Burnham references getting unsufferable yet? <laughs> In this section, I wanna talk a little bit about friendships ending. If they should, when they do, what do we do? So the first lie I think I was told, or like I just felt, was that just because like a friendship seems to be cooling, it's over. So there's like, obviously like when you meet friends or you know, you get really close to them, you have like a big clicking time, but it's not always gonna feel like magic in the same way that relationships don't always feel like magic. There are gonna be times where you just have like one friendship date and it's a bit awkward. And even some of my best friends today, like I've had those moments where I'm like, oh, is this friendship like cooling down? But I think that's kind of totally natural. And as long as both parties feel like maybe you need some space, I think that's totally fine. So there's, there's some of my best friends in the world I didn't talk to that much during uni. <laughs> we were all busy, things happen, and then moments happen where we kind of drift back together again and it's just how it was when we were kids. So I think that's totally normal as long as nobody feels like there's some kind of boundary being crossed or like they're being abandoned. I don't always think it's, it's, it's necessary to completely close the door on a friendship just because maybe you're drifting apart for a little while or you're in different places for a little bit. I think that's totally fine and it's not always, in, in the same way with the relationships, it's not always gonna be like walks on the beach and romantic meals. Another one, friendships that do end are failures. Not true. There's so many friendships that I've had that have supported me and that person through a hard time or through a weird moment in our lives, a weird experience, like working at a place that treats you like shit or going to uni in a place that's far away from everywhere else. And I, I think those friendships were big successes in the same way that I think about relationships that end, but you know, they, they can still be a success just because they end. It doesn't mean that it was a failure. Um, so I think that's something that has a lot of like shame and stigma around it being like, oh yeah, I used to be friends with that person and now we're not. <gasps> it, it doesn't always have to be like that. It doesn't mean it has to be a negative experience. People who are only willing to fix things at breaking point just didn't realize how serious things were. I've had this quite a few times where you've voiced um, a, an issue or a worry or, or an ouch moment in your friendship and they haven't changed their behavior. And it's only when you, you bring up the idea of ending the friendship or backing off or something like that, that they change. So it's only, only at the point where they are gonna lose something. This happened to me in relationships as well. It's only at the point where they are gonna lose something that they act or change. I think the reason that somebody should take you seriously is because they love you, not because they're going to lose something. So I think those those red flag moments happen when you've voiced the concern or the pain, uh, not at the moment when you go, actually, this is this is the breaking point. I can't take this anymore. And the last one, if a friendship ends, it's not a big deal. It bloody is. <laughs> It's a huge deal. We don't think about grieving when it comes to friendships in the same way we do relationships or like, you know, actual death of people. But at the end of the day, these are people leaving your life. Often with friendships, you've actually probably been alongside them longer than you have in a relationship. There's usually less communication at the end, less of a framework to like hang your misery off or like work stuff out what went wrong. And I think they can be incredibly painful and you need to give yourself space to grieve, to feel a little bit differently, to be functioning on 50% for a while. Also, I've got ammo. In this book, The Joy of Being Selfish, uh, Michelle says something that I was like, oh yes, that's such a good point. 
She's talking about toxic friendships. And just because you have a toxic friendship doesn't mean that you are like a good friend versus a toxic friend or like a bad person. Um, she says, the word toxic is used often, but I believe more in toxic dynamics and toxic behaviors than toxic people because we are not our behaviors. <laughs> Sometimes there have been toxic dynamics in my life that, that doesn't, isn't necessarily anything I can pin on them and not really directly anything I can pin on me. Just a dynamic that exists between us that isn't healthy and recognizing that uh, that space between you might be what the problem is rather than either of you individually being evil is really helpful. And she also says in this that a good friend is better than an old friend. Oh my God. <laughs> Here's to old friends that still spark joy, uh, but here's also to new friends and making room for more people in your life and to learn more as you grow. To that, cheers. Oh, <laughs> morning. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know what happened either, but I do know you started adding shots to our hot chocolate, so it's fine. I had a good night, you had a good night. Uh, I know that you've got to be off this morning, so I'm going to make you a heat cup of coffee to go. Does that work? Yeah, brilliant. Oh, it's been so nice seeing you again. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know that we talked a lot last night, but I just want you to know that you are a great friend. And friendship is a skill. Not everybody gets it first try, but I think you're doing a great job. Um, if you like this video, there is a series on my channel called The Twenties Toolkit, uh, where you can find out loads of different kinds of advice and stuff. This video was free to watch, but it was made possible by the people in the Gumption Club who tip me per video to make sure they have... Did I just go into video mode? Sorry, it's really embarrassing. I do that with guests a lot. I know, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I mean, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Thanks for coming. Bye.